we have in Jesus Christ. Well, I've asked that our freedom director, Mrs. Christina Crane, to come up. Where is she? She's over here. Would you welcome her? We're going to take some time this morning. She has crafted a message that's not a one-time message. This is built really out of what I've assigned her to do years ago here at South Bay. This is the message. I want it to permeate every ministry in this house. But most importantly, I want it to permeate your heart. I want it to permeate your life. Because I think we are underdeveloped when it comes to disciples of Christ. And I think you'll hear a very strong message. So, so let me pray and then we'll begin. Okay, Father, thank you so much for the opportunity for Christina and I to just sit here, um, open your word, and dig into what your son Jesus Christ went through and what he did. We receive from you now, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, South Bay. Uh, I just want to thank you, Pastor, for inviting me up here. Um, I'm really humbled uh, to be able to share this message with you. It's a message of my heart, but more importantly, uh, it's a message of your Father in Heaven's heart. Um, and I know that it's a message of your heart. And oh, Pastor David said that we have a ministry on Monday nights, and it's freedom, freedom ministry. And we meet over here in the back wing, and I want you to know that freedom is the heart of this house. But freedom isn't just a ministry that happens on Monday nights. Freedom is a ministry that happens every single day in your own life. It's a ministry that when we live out the way that Christ has made us to be, then we are living free. Uh, friends, do you agree that Christ came for our freedom? Can we agree with that? Uh, in the church, we largely do not live free. We largely miss the boat when it comes to living out fully the freedom that Christ wrote about, talked about, taught all of us to have, and ultimately died for. If you would, turn in your Bibles with me to Luke 4. I want to talk about freedom today because I believe that we can live free if we understand our world and we understand how it works. Namely, we don't live free because we don't understand it and we don't understand how it operates. And the best way that I can tell you or, or show you how to do that is by a passage in Scripture, a story of Christ himself. I want to set up the story a little bit, though, and give you some context. So Jesus, he, we don't know a lot about his early years. We know that he was born. Hopefully we all know that he was born. Uh, we also know that he got stuck in the synagogue once, uh, hanging out with everybody, um, and his parents yelled at him for that. Uh, we also know that John came and baptized him. As soon as he was baptized, the heavens open up. God says, this is my son whom I'm well pleased. He, he gives him an identity. He gives him the truth of who he is. And he says, I'm pleased with you. Jesus hasn't done anything yet. He hasn't conquered sin yet. He hasn't even started his ministry yet. But God says, I'm pleased with you. So this is a scene. He's baptized, and the next time we see Jesus in the New Testament is when he is wandering around the wilderness. And I'm going to pick up with you guys starting in Luke chapter 4, verse 1. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days, and when they were ended, he was hungry. Before we get into the nuts and bolts of this story, I want to set the stage a little bit further for you and say, hey, Jesus was real, like you and me, flesh and blood. He, we sometimes forget that. Like, he was 40 days hungry. I am four hours hungry. <laughs> okay? All the time. And so Jesus, he's in, he's in the flesh. He's wandering around the wilderness. He's faced with the elements. He's faced with the things that are going on in the wilderness. And he is by himself out there. Our battle happens in this world. It happens in reality. You and I are not immune to living on earth. And Jesus wasn't in that story either. But it says that he was for 40 days and 40 nights tempted by the devil. That sounds like the stuff my nightmares are made out of, right? 40 days and 40 nights. 
But Jesus understood something about how to live in this world that oftentimes we miss. He understood that we weren't just walking around in this physical, natural world. He understood that we were married to the spiritual world. That there are two realms that we deal with every single day. The next verse goes on to say, The devil said to him, That's the first part of it. The devil said to him, I don't know about you, but if I knew the devil was talking to me, I might walk away. No, I would run away. Let's be real. Um, I don't know about you, but do you think of the devil looking like a cartoon character? Something with some pointy horns? Maybe something like that? Or maybe you're a little bit more creative or seen a little bit too many scary movies and you think of him as something like this. Okay? Either way... I've never seen any of that outside of TV, outside of Halloween, outside of any of that. But if we think that the devil looks like that, we're going to miss him when he starts to come up to us and speak, right? We're going to miss the fact that he's actually going to speak to us and we can respond. Jesus lived in both the natural world and the spiritual world. He understood that they could not be separated. And if we're going to live free, we have to understand the same thing, that every single day we live between these two. My husband's car didn't work this morning. Couldn't work 10 minutes before he was going to be here. And that just so happens to be our physical problem in this natural world today. No, friends. There is always something spiritual behind the, the natural. Always. And if we don't have eyes for it, then we are going to be always living less than the freedom God has for us. The other thing we need to keep in mind is that we have an enemy who is out to get us. God has prepared us for good works. In fact, Ephesians 6.12 says, For we... Uh, do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. You are wrestling, friends. You are wrestling with an enemy who is out to destroy what God has for you. Out to destroy who you are, out to destroy what you're capable of, out to destroy what your future is. And so as we go into this story, which is a real life story here, I want you to go in it with the lenses of in your life, we live in this natural world and we live in the spiritual world. And you have an enemy that's on your tail. Jesus was able to do all of these things and conquer all of these things with the same Holy Spirit that you have in you. So I believe that we can take some principles from this story and learn how we can live free. Let's go to uh, verse 3. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become friend, to become bread. The first thing that we need to know when we are living out our freedom, the first way that we live out our freedom and live free is to know your identity. Know your identity. Let me rephrase some of this. The devil came up against who Christ was. He says, He's taunting him. If you are the son of God, if that's who you say you are, you think you are, just in case you forgot, if that's who you are, then do this thing. Take on and sustain yourself. Let me paraphrase it for you. The devil said to him, if you are the son of God, the son of all-knowing, all-powerful creator who is a sustainer of all life and provider of all eternal life, who creates whatever he wants just out of his voice, if that's really who you are and who you think you are, then why don't you just command, say something to this stone? Why don't you become bread yourself? Why don't you, uh, like you're supposed to do, you know, sustain yourself, take care of yourself, protect yourself, provide for yourself? Do you see how the enemy taunted him? Jesus is the bread of life. Jesus was at creation. He participated in creation. He was there before all of us began. And he is the son of God. He could turn that rock into bread. That's not the issue. The devil was coming after who he is. The devil comes after who you are. If you are really doing the things that God wanted you to do, Dave, Christina, then your husband's car would work and it would get here on time. 
if you really are a son or daughter of Christ, then those circumstances that are going on in your life wouldn't be so bad. They wouldn't be so terrible. Uh, if you really are God's child, then you should be able to do whatever you want and take care of yourself. Jesus stood up against the devil because he knew who he was. God started, remember we talked in the baptism, God said, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased. Jesus answered him, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. He's quoting an old passage that basically says, Satan, God's my source. I don't need you to tell me what I can or cannot do. Who I am does not change with those things. Jesus was saying, I know who I am. God is my source and I'm good. He wasn't willing to accept the temptation. Friends, do you know who you are? Jesus declares you as his if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. And he says that you are his child and that he's pleased with you and that you are good. And the enemy wants to come in every single day, daily. For me, it's moment by moment. And try and convince you that you need to take it into your own hands. He wants to feed you those lies. The first way that we live free in this world is we know who we are. David said that there were young people that went across the world to plant churches. They were participants in God's work because they knew who they were. That makes all the difference. Let's continue in our text. Verse 5. And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. I have to kind of pause here um, because this is before Facebook, YouTube, Instagram. Like this is 2,000 years ago. There's no fancy technology and the devil just so happens to be able to show him everything in a moment of time. It's a little trippy. And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and said to him, To you I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I will give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Satan likes to use the things of this world to manipulate our perspectives, right? I need to have this, or I need to be like this person, or I need to do that thing. And he likes to manipulate the things that are in our world to show us different things and make us believe them. In fact, he offers us a consistent counterfeit. Consistently he offers us a counterfeit. Jesus, just in case you forget who you are, you know, that you're God of the universe, in charge of everything, powerful over everything, just in case you forget it, I'll offer you some of my power. Jesus, just in case you forget that you're the King of kings and Lord of lords, just in case that all glory goes to you for all creation, um, I'll give you some of their glory, some of this stuff. The devil showed up and said, hey, I want to offer you a counterfeit power. I want to offer you a counterfeit authority, and I want to offer you a counterfeit glory. But all he has to offer is junk. It's useless. It's hand-me-downs. Jesus says that if we walk with him, if we know who he is, then we have access to the same power and authority that Christ has. John 12, or John 14, 12, I should say. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and even greater works than these will he do, because I'm going to the Father. Do you believe that, friends? That we have access to do things, even greater things than Christ, because we can walk in that same power and that same authority. The second way that we live free the, is if we know our identity, we also need to practice our ability. Practice our ability. Jesus answered him and said, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. It's kind of like dropping the mic. Boom. Right? Like, there, this is a no-brainer. Jesus is saying, Hey, I know who I am. 
I'm pretty much in charge of your power too. So like, get out of here. That's right. Come on. If you are a child of God, then you have power. He's quoting an old passage that basically says, all other gods, their power is nothing in comparison to the God of the Most High. Friends, do you walk daily practicing your position in Christ? Do you walk daily practicing your power in Christ? Or are you using a counterfeit? If the devil came up to me and started talking to me, I think I would run away. But what did Jesus do? He spoke back. And when we speak back to the enemy and we speak back to the lies that he's offering us and we speak back to the temptations that he's putting before us, we practice our power and we practice our authority. Come on. Jesus responded and he said, I know my position and I know my power. God is my source. I'm good. Back off. And when we do the same thing, when we tell the enemy to back off and get out of our world, then we live free. We live the freedom that Christ has made us to live. And oftentimes, friends, out of all of these, this one is under attack all the time. The enemy tries to tell you, don't open your mouth, you'll sound silly. Don't open your mouth, it won't work. And he puts it under attack. Your ability in Christ is under siege. And if you don't open up your mouth, you're going to miss the opportunity to live free, to live what Christ came for you to have. Let's move on. Verse 9. And he took him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, then throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you. And on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. We still don't have teleportation? Like, that's still not a thing? He literally pulled him right up out of the desert and threw him up on top of the temple. And yet... We think that the enemy doesn't have a way of manipulating our worlds and our thoughts. I want to show you something. There's a a map here. Over here on this side, you'll see in the pink, uh, we know that Jesus was baptized um, up by the the Sea of Galilee, up by uh, Capernaum, somewhere around that area, that region. And we know that at this scene in the... In the story, he ends up in Jerusalem where the temple is. So all of that pink represents this wilderness that he would have been hanging out in for the 40 days and 40 nights. It also represents where he would have had this dialogue with the devil. Over here, we see this is a screenshot of the city of Jerusalem. Very simple, but essentially the middle over here is where the temple is. Now, the pinnacle of the temple where the devil took him would have been the highest point in the city. Jesus would have had a vantage point of where he came from in the wilderness. He would have had a vantage point over all of the city and all over the area. What he would have also been able to see was where Calvary or Golgotha, as they called it, would have been. He would have had eyes to see where his destiny was taking him. What the enemy was saying when he said, for it is written... He will command his angels concerning you to guard you, and on their hands they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. He was quoting a prophecy. And Jesus has lots of prophecies that were about him, and he fulfilled all of them. Really cool thing. But this one in particular, the devil came to him and said, Hey, I know this about you. I know that you're supposed to die for all mankind. And I know that, the, that your angels are going to have your back. And essentially, he took him up to the highest point in the temple, and he offered him an easy way out. He offered him a shortcut. He played into who Jesus was and where Jesus was going, and he said, hey, but you could just die right here. Like, in case you forgot who you are, what you're supposed to do, you know, killing that whole sin thing, in case you forgot all of that, why don't you just die right here and fulfill this prophecy, which you're also supposed to do, and your angels will take care of you. The third way that we are going to live free is that we're going to believe in our destiny. 
Believe in your destiny. We need to not only know our identity and practice our ability, but we need to believe that we have a destiny. We need to believe that we have it, it's ours, and that God is going to help us fulfill it. The devil offered him an opportunity to shortcut it. The devil offered him an opportunity for him to do it in his own strength and his own power without the help of his God. And Jesus answered him, verse 12, It is said, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. Jesus knew his destiny. He sat at the pinnacle of the temple and he could see what was behind him, but he had eyes for where he was going. And he was not willing to sacrifice all of our freedoms because he, the devil got in the way. Because the devil offered him something that would have been a shortcut, easy, get it done and over with. You don't have to do the rest. He, didn't, he offered him a skirt around the hard stuff of the cross and Jesus didn't take it. Friends, does the enemy speak to you about your destiny and your purpose? Does he speak to you that you don't have one? Does he speak to you that you need to take it into your own hands? Or is God your source? Do you have eyes for your destiny? Never in all of history have you been on this planet. Your thoughts, your looks, your abilities, your strengths. No one else can do what God puts you on this earth to do. And constantly, the enemy is going to come out and say, no, you're not really here to do much. And what you are doing, this is, you should settle for whatever. But do you know that God has more for you? Do you know that God has dreams for more? That he wants you to be a participator in his destiny for you? Jesus responded, It is said, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. He basically said, Back off. He said, I know my destiny. God's got it, and I'm good. He said the same thing every single time. He told the devil to back off because Jesus knew who he was. He knew what he was capable of, and he knew what his destiny was. Psalm 138.8 says, The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not abandon the works of your hands. Friends, if we're going to live free, we need to live with the understanding to know our identity. Don't let the enemy come in and tell you something else. And I'll tell you what, he can chatter all day long. But that's why we need to practice our ability. We need to open up our mouths and walk in the power and position that Christ has given us. And we need to believe our destiny. We need to believe that there is more to this earth than what we can see and that God is using us, that he's using us for his kingdom and his glory. Jesus gets baptized. God says, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased. He goes in the wilderness And he remembers who he is. He practices his power and his position. And he knows and stays focused on his destiny. And immediately, immediately, friends, he walks into the synagogue in Nazareth. They hand him a scroll. And he looks on the scroll, and this is what he reads. It's written in Luke 5, if you're following along with me. But he's reading Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. To comfort all who mourn. To grant to those who mourn in Zion. To give to them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes. The oil of gladness instead of mourning. The garment of praise instead of a faint spirit. That they may be called oaks of righteousness. The planting of the Lord that he may be glorified. Friends, this is why Christ came. He literally goes from being baptized to being tempted to reading out this prophecy about him before he does any miracles, before he does any ministry. He says, I came for your freedom. I came to proclaim good news. 
to mend your broken hearts, to proclaim freedom and liberty, to open up prisons, to give you the Lord's favor, to comfort you, to give you gladness, to give you a beautiful headdress, to give you a garment of praise, to give you a new name, a name of righteousness. This is who Christ says that you are. This is what Christ came to do. He came so that you would live free. And when we know our identity and we practice our ability and we believe in our destiny, we can walk out the freedom that Christ came for. Friends, I'm going to... In freedom, we talk a lot about what pings in your spirit. It's that thing that's hitting at you. Where are you at this morning? Has the devil been after your identity? Has he been trying to tell you who you are? Maybe define you by other relationships in your life or lack thereof or circumstances that are going on or hardships or how you work? Is he after your ability? Is he after, is he trying to tell you that you need to keep your mouth shut? That you can't stand up and fight because you're not one of those Christians. You're not that strong yet. Is he after your position and trying to tell you that you're not worthy to sit with him and have that power and authority over the, the evil forces of darkness? Or is he after your destiny? Is he trying to tell you that you're not good enough for it? That it's not going to come to pass? Or maybe you don't even have one at all? If you want more freedom... I want to invite you to come forward. I want to pray over those of you who want more freedom. And I'm going to be the first one to stand up here and say, I want more freedom. If you can relate to any of those things, I want you to come. Take a stand of boldness and say, hey, I want to live free. The enemy has my identity under siege, but I'm not going to stand for that anymore. The enemy has my ability under siege, but I'm not going to live for that anymore. The en enemy has my destiny under siege, but I'm not going to live for that anymore. I know that in my own life, it's daily. And in freedom, the ministry on Monday nights, we say that you can never get enough freedom. It doesn't end because Christ has come for the fullness in you. So I'm just going to say a prayer of blessing for those who are up here. Father, I just thank you for those who are desiring more. Lord, I just pray over them specifically. I thank you for their faithfulness and their boldness. Lord, I pray that you would show them and speak to them about who you have made them to be. That you see them as sons and daughters of the Most High God. That you have given them every blessing in the heavenly places. God, that you have poured on them power to deal with the forces of darkness in this evil age. God, I pray that you would continue to reveal to them their destiny. Lord, that they haven't missed it, that it's not done yet, that there's more for them. God, would you give them freedom? Would you give them places of healing? Would you give them places of comfort? Would you give them places where you give them a new name? Father, would you give them the things that they long for and desire for? Would you give them the things that you desire for them? God, that you would give them freedom in areas that have been long forgotten or always haunting them. Would you give them freedom? Would you tell them who they are, where other things have told them where they are? God, I thank you for those who have come, but Lord, I also pray for those who have not, who their spirits and their hearts are saying, I want that too, Lord. I pray freedom over this house, that we would be a people that not just hear your word, but that we would be doers of your word, that we would live knowing who you've made us to be, that we would live in the power and authority, we would live knowing your destiny. And Satan, we say, you have no power over these. Amen. They belong to Jesus. Amen. He is the king. He is the authority here. And you have no place over them. Amen. Where you have been wreaking havoc, where you have been taking siege, you are done. And we break every yes. spirit in the name of Jesus. Every name and unnamed name. You have no place in this house. God, I thank you that you have all control over these people. And your spirit does not just dwell with us here today, but Lord, that it will go with them throughout this week. And Lord, I thank you that your ministry of freedom goes with them. God, we pray these things because of your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for his example. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Job well done. 
I pray that this message is etched into your bones, your identity, your ability, and your destiny. Without it, without an understanding of who you are, what you're to do, and where we're all going, without it, we're never going to achieve the things that God has laid before us to do. Good things, satisfying things, things that bring peace and joy into our lives. Are you glad that you were in the house of the Lord today? Yeah, yeah we have an amazing team here at South Bay. I'm honored to even work with them. Listen, if this message touched your heart in such a way that you'd like further conversation, immediately following this service, uh, we're going to be down here at the front, and we would love to pray for you. If you want to understand more about identity, ability, and destiny, maybe you would like to join us on Monday night. We are seeing people set free, backwards and forwards, up and down, left and right, because they're grabbing hold of the truth of the message of Jesus Christ. This message is going to permeate every aspect of this house. I will see to it. And I want you to experience it as well. God bless you. Let me pray for you and we'll be dismissed. Lord, thank you for an amazing morning in your house. Thank you for the opportunity to worship. And I thank you, God, for the opportunity to meet new friends today. Lord, thank you for moms. And all God's people said, amen. amen. God bless you.